So um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak a little bit about my experiences with Boris. And uh, I started out trying to integrate my work with, with my recollections of Boris. And I thought, you know, I get to talk about the stuff I do all the time. I'm getting bored of it, in fact. But I don't get to talk about Boris all the time. So I thought, let's, let's take advantage of the opportunity to reflect a little bit. So how did I ever come to work with Boris? Well, in part, it was fate. Um, I was uh, an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, Beth Jones was my advisor. And she had been a postdoc with Boris. So uh, that, uh, case closed right there. That's how it's going to end up. And then to make matters worse, Terry Cooper was right across the street at the University of Pittsburgh. We had joint group meetings together. So I learned a lot about Boris, and I got to think a lot about metabolism and regulation. So there was no way on earth I wasn't going to work with Boris. <laughs> and then I discovered later on another connection, which is that um, Boris met his uh, late first wife, Adele, at Columbia University when they were graduate students together. Adele used to have this pal named Celia Levine, and they used to hang around together and study. Celia was another graduate student there. And um, when they had big exams, they'd actually get a dorm room so they could stay up all night studying. <laughs> and they used to invite Celia Levine's little sister, Alice Levine, as long as Alice didn't talk too much, which I happen to know is one of her problems. <laughs> Alice Levine married this guy, William J. Mitchell. They decided to have some kids, and one of them was me. <laughs> so case closed, I had to work with Boris. But that's not why I work with Boris. <laughs> this is why. So I've been carrying this notebook around for 37 years. Okay, I just took count. It's on my desk in my office. And it's been on every desk in every office I've ever had. Microbial physiology 721. <laughs> okay? And you know, it's not that I ever even look at it. It's that it's such an integral part of who I am and how I came to be that I can't imagine life without it. But I did open it up. And it was fun. You know, I remember that um, I was warned that Boris's lectures were captivating. So I was really compulsive about taking notes, because I was worried if I ever stopped writing for a second, then I'd just be transfixed and I'd lose the thread. And you can see, you know, as many of us in that audience know, I mean, Boris, when he wanted to talk about clostridia fermentation, he talked about clostridia, it's anaerobic, it lived in soil, blah, blah, blah. It was so much fun. I just wrote down all this stuff, because, as I said. So I wanted to just pull a couple of pages out for you, because, uh, and you'll see why. So, nitrogen metabolism. <laughs> the best lecture, right? So ammonia is generally a good nitrogen source for microorganisms, but where does it enter in metabolism? Once you get into metabolism, you can shuffle it around like a deck of cards. That's not a problem. And the main entry point was thought to be glutamate dehydrogenase. So here's Bor I love this is a real Borisism. Okay, the evidence first, the enzyme exists. Right? <laughs> so it's got to be doing something, right? It exists. And then secondly, <clears throat> there's this other enzyme that it could run backwards and maybe, you know, help, help with ammonia acquisition, but uh, there isn't much of it in the cell, so that's not going to work out. So it's got to be glutamate dehydrogenase. So we now can predict the properties of mutants in that glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme. They have mutant properties, but there's something wrong. No mutant of this has ever been found. So we've got to think of some other explanation. And then, if that isn't bad enough, you can grow cells on such low ammonia concentrations that the glutamate dehydrogenase reaction couldn't run forwards. It has to run backwards. And this is like one of Boris's big things about metabolism. <laughs> if you're going to scavenge for a scarce nutrient, you cannot use a dehydrogenase, because they're intrinsically reversible reactions. You've got to drive the reaction somehow. Well, of course, we know how Boris drove those reactions, right? Glutamine synthetase. So that was the first time in that course that he mentioned the enzyme uh, with which his name will forever be associated. Okay? I, I think he made the enzyme famous. <laughs> I don't think the enzyme made Boris famous. And for many of you who took the course or listened to Boris's lectures, you'll appreciate this. Equilibrium here. 
<laughs> right? So this was the whole thing, that if you could drive an acquisition reaction with ATP, then you could drive a reaction towards acquisition even at low substrate concentrations. And that was the virtue of glutamine synthetase that Boris, uh, that Boris loved the most. So what was life like in Boris's lab? Well, I'm sure you've all seen this fantastic conversation with Boris Magasanic. And about halfway through the video, some kid in the audience figures, this Magasanic guy seems pretty smart. I'm going to ask him for some advice. So he says, how did you choose what to work on? You know, you're a smart guy. Help me out here. And Boris says, it was not a plan. It was one thing leading into another. And that was it. That was the, that was the fun of working with Boris. So I, kind of, I tried to translate his pitch to me about working in this lab into 21st century parlance. So the research proposal, why don't you work on glutamine synthetase? Mm -hmm. I could do yeast glutamine synthetase. I could do anything I wanted to, biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology if it had been invented. And he didn't care. He knew we were going to have fun. He knew we were going to learn something new. And then my favorite, the mentorship plan. I'll stop by Aaron's desk every day to discuss results. <laughs> and you know, we were all laughing a little bit earlier about how we used to, you know, if we could, were lucky enough to get two good results in a day, we'd save one for a dry spell. <laughs> you know, we knew Boris was going to come over and talk to us. But you know, if you think about it, life doesn't get better than this, right? You can work on whatever the heck you want to, and you get to talk with Boris about it every single day. And that, that was heaven. So what did we talk about? I, I picked out a couple of quotes that I remember vividly. I first thought that yeast was a big bacteria, <laughs> but in fact it was a small <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, what he meant was that yeast is going to work differently from bacteria, and that's cool. And that, what was nice is, you know, our starting point for every conversation was, well, maybe it's going to be the same as bacteria. And then we'd do some experiments, we'd get some weird observations, and we'd start thinking, well, maybe it's different. Let us do a thought experiment. Did anybody do a thought experiment with Boris? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what was great about this is what he meant was, how good is our model? You know, where are we lacking enough detail to make a prediction? And then that's where we've got to fill in the blanks. That's where we have to fill in the gaps. And then my absolute favorite, it might be Something else, something different from whatever I was thinking. And what Boris was trying to do was either himself, or even better if you could get me, to come up with two explanations for every observation. And you know, the way Boris was, was if you had two explanations, then it was pretty simple to come up with an experiment that would distinguish between them. And even maybe both your explanations would be wrong, but then at least you'd have a new experimental result to guide your thinking. So that was always fun. Now biobiology and biofilms. This is as close as I'm going to get to my science here. So I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you know, in my generation, everybody on the, on the planet Earth knew that between gal and bio and E. coli lay prophage lambda. Okay, that was it. The birth of molecular biology. And I always thought, and I mean, it's like I kind of stared across the street there, and I thought, you know, here we are working on Klebsiella, not me, but many people in the lab, in Boris's lab, and between gal and bio, are the hut genes. <laughs> so how come we're working on the hut genes and not that cool phage lambda? And so in Boris's, uh, this lovely autobiographical uh, piece, he says, well, you know, the hut genes are involved in liberating carbon and nitrogen from histidine. They're repressed by glucose, that's carbon catabolite repression. And they're also repressed by ammonia, that's nitrogen catabolite repression, that's what he wants to study. But there's only one thing. They're only repressed by ammonia in Klebsiella orogenes. So that's how he chose his organism. He followed the biology. Now, he fully realized that, uh, following the work of uh, Minot and Jacob, that you needed to do genetics. And there was just no genetics early on in Klebsiella. So he, he started looking at some other organisms for, uh, for a system that would work. And then finally, a transducing phage was discovered for Klebsiella. So he could return to his passion and study hut gene regulation. And what did he discover? A close relationship between the regulation of synthesis of glutamine synthetase, caps my own, and of histidase in response to the availability of ammonia. So the thing is that Boris kind of followed the biology there that he was interested in, 
And he basically uh, found, you know, unraveled the underpinnings of nitrogen catabolite repression in bacteria. And that's his scientific legacy. And you know, I sort of faced a similar kind of decision, except I had a great model to follow, um, where I had been trained to work on Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which has amazing genetics and incredible resources. And I started getting interested in infection biology and biofilm formation and how people actually get sick and die. And um, so I started, I turned my attention to Candida albicans, which had barely any genetics and resources. Nobody in the field knew how to spell the word resource. <laughs> so it didn't exist. And, but you know, as happened with Boris, as people started working on this organism, the genetic tools have become more and more available. The molecular tools have become more and more available. And the virtue is the biology, that we can grow biofilms of this uh, organism in vitro, but also we can grow biofilms in animal infection models, such as in a venous catheter infection model. So when we find a mutant that fails to make a biofilm under controlled growth conditions in the lab, we can also see if it's really worth following in terms of infection biology. <sighs> this, I know, you won't believe this. If it were up to me, my, my wife is back there, she'll, Barb, you'll confirm this, right? If it were up to me, I would be a graduate student here now, <laughs> to this day. I was having such a great time in Boris. And you know, you look at you do whatever you want, you talk to Boris every day. It was, it was life was simple, it was good. But you know, eventually, my, I had a postdoc lined up for like two years. My, my postdoc mentor called me up and said, are you ever going to show up? Then I had like a fellowship. I had to activate it. All those things I said, I, I'll worry about some other time. But then finally, Barb canceled the lease on our apartment. So I, <laughs> if I was going to be staying here, I was going to have to be living under the Longfellow Bridge. <laughs> so I scheduled a thesis defense. And um, there it is, my graduation photo. And I wonder if you think the same thing I do when you see this, which is, that fellow does not look too smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. So thank you.